Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for attending my talk today. Uh, to be honest, I've given around 10 to 12 talks thus far in the past couple of years, but I've never done a multi-track. So last night, I was literally sitting and thinking to myself, oh my god, please let someone come to my talk. Let there be at least one person. <laughs> um, so I'm really glad to see um, that all of you came, and I hope that I can make it worth your while. So I, Bali did an amazing job of introducing me. Um, but I'm just going to give a brief introduction to myself as well. So my name is Ridwana Khan. And I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Smile Identity. Uh, basically, at Smile Identity, we use machine learning and facial recognition to be able to verify people's identity. Um, as Mbali mentioned, I'm also um, I'm really passionate about cultivating diverse and um, innovative and inclusive environments within the industry. Being a minority myself, I have experienced all kinds of environments, and I am truly just passionate about creating ones that are inclusive. And finally, I have a nonprofit organization called Kasimet. Um, I care very deeply about the education space in South Africa, and uh, Kasimet basically aims to um, expose students to STEM and also to build on their foundations. Um, and finally, to just expose them to opportunities that we have in the industry. So to set the scene for this talk, and I'd like to give you background on my career, just so that you can see why I think uh, creating diverse teams and uh, effective teams are so important. So I started out in a corporate around eight to 10 years ago. Um, it was a pretty big corporate, it was Dimension Data, and I worked in a subset, uh, a, a child company called Internet Solutions. When I started in the first team, I was the only woman developer with 13 other men. Um, it turned out to be really good uh, in terms of the environment and how productive it was, but it was still a little bit shocking to me coming into the industry. Um, I worked at Dimension Data for three years, um, and then I started up my own software development company. When I started up my own software development company, as a co-founder, I was respon responsible for actually building out those teams. I also ended up collaborating with a lot of other teams, so external companies, external teams. Um, I left my company around two years ago, and then I ended up at Smile Identity. So the unique thing about Smile Identity is that the team that I'm currently working on, working in, is actually based in around six to seven different countries. Uh, we all work remotely, and there's a huge time zone issue between here and the US where some of the software developers are actually based. So during this time, I've acquired skills to be able to help me to be more effective within this team. And finally, within my nonprofit organization, I'm also working on building out a team. But the unique aspect of this uh, particular foundation is that because we're in, early in the early stages, it's essentially impact work. So none of the, my team members actually get paid for their work. There's no monetary compensation. They're essentially doing this because they feel passionate and they want to make an impact to people's lives. So each of these experiences in my career has actually taught me something new. I've learned a lot from each one of these experiences. And I'd like to use these experiences um, within the rest of my talk. As an employee of a company, I feel that it's important to me to be appreciated and for me to be fe feeling fulfilled. And that sounds pretty simple, but in actual fact, there's been very few companies that I've worked with where I felt both of those things. As a leader of a team, it's also important to have your different team members working well together and collaborating to be able to uh, have a productive environment. So you can expect the following from my talk. Um, first, I'm going to look at some of the big tech companies and how they basically create effective teams. Uh, second, I will look at the ways to build an effective team. Um, then we're going to go through some recap, and finally, we'll conclude. So the case studies that I'm going to be focusing on is Google, Cisco, and Netflix. 
since we're DevFest and we're talking all things Google, let's start off with Google. So in 2012, Google embarked on a quest on how to build the perfect team. The experiment, which was led by Abir Dubé, and I hope I'm not butchering people's names in this talk. I'm, I tried really hard. <laughs> um, so this experiment uh, basically was created by him, and he called it Project Aristotle. And the reason he called it Project Aristotle because it was a tribute to Aristotle's quote, which is, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The goal was to determine what makes a team effective at Google. So the research measured team effectiveness in four ways. Firstly, executive evaluation of a team, then team leader evaluation of the team, team member evaluation of a team, and finally, sales performance against quarterly quota. Quarterly quota is a bit tongue twisting. Um, the researchers found that what matters was less about who was on the team, but rather how they collaborated on a whole. In order of importance, these were the findings. So the first thing they realized is that psychological safety was really, really important in a team. Everyone believed that they needed to feel psychologically safe. I'm going to talk about psychological safety a little bit later on. Then um, they also realized that dependability was important, structure and clarity, meaning, and finally, impact. The researchers discovered that there were other things that were not significantly important. <coughs> Things like the co-location of team members, the team size, the performance of the individual team members, tenure, um, and just workload size, things like that. While it's important, it's important to realize that whilst Google didn't think these things affected the actual performance of the team, there are other companies that do think that individual members are, the, the actual individual team member is important rather than just the collaboration of the team. So Cisco focused deeply on building specific actions to contribute to the best teams. The way that they um, sort of measure team effectiveness and work on building productive teams is firstly, they assess each team member's strengths. So they do something like the Gallup um, Strength Finder where they figure out what's your strengths and they actually build a team based on putting together people whose strengths complement each other. They also do weekly check-ins, and they found that when they've done weekly check-ins, uh, their rate of engagement has increased from 13% to 16%. They've also had a 2.7x increase in the retention when team members had those chat with their team, when team leaders had chats with team members. They pulse their teams, so when employees check in, they do, sorry, when employees check in, they measure, they ask them to rate their impact and their value. And they found that if the impact and value drops from week to week, then they start having meaningful conversations around that. And finally, they believe in working towards a common purpose with a common goal and common outcomes. Finally, the most interesting culture and surprising culture I found is Netflix. So when you go on the Netflix web website, they basically um, describe a dream team. And they say, a dream team is one in which all of your colleagues are extraordinary at what they do and are highly effective collaborators. The value and satisfaction of being on a dream team is tremendous. Our version of the great workplace is not sushi lunches, great gyms, fancy offices, or frequent parties. Our version of the great workplace is a dream team in pursuit of ambitious common goals for which we spend heavily. It is on such a team that you learn the most, perform your best work, improve the fastest, and have the most fun. So just in comparison to the other Silicon Valley companies, Netflix doesn't actually have fancy offices, and they don't have, as they say, fancy lunches and uh, canteens and gyms, etc. But the most interesting and surprising um, fact about Netflix is that they tend not to hire recent graduates, junior developers, or anybody in an entry-level role. Their entire team consists mostly of senior developers. I just want to put that statement out there for now, and later on, I actually want to go into detail of discussing the repercussions of this. 
So from the three cases above, you'll see that each company has its own way of um, determining what an effective team is and determining productivity. In the same manner, each individual, when you go for an interview, you look for different things in a company. To me, the definition of an effective team is one that can find innovative solutions to problems and be able to grow continuously. In order for a team to be effective, there are a couple of things that, we need, that I feel are really important. So the first one, and you know I'm really passionate about that, so of course it's going to be first on the list, is diversity and inclusion. Secondly, uh, working towards common goals. Thirdly is communication, and fourth is psychological safety. So in recent years, we've really focused on diversity and inclusion, but I feel like the progress is not there as yet. We don't have fully diverse teams within our industry. Diversity comes in many forms. It's not only about gender. We have race, we have religious affiliation, sexual orientation, age, disability, even skill set. Diversity is also pretty much useless without inclusion. My favorite saying is, um, diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. So why is diversity so important? So the first thing that diversity does is it improves a team's problem-solving capabilities. Because we're from different ba backgrounds or skill sets, um, each person thereby has the unique way of problem-solving. And then we, we also have different ways of processing information because we come from these different backgrounds. Homogeneous teams, however, tend to actually solve problems in pretty much the same manner. So let's take a step back and look at Netflix's example. So I feel like when you are in a team with only senior developers, senior developers tend to have their mind set on a lot of things already. We know that we're very set in our ways, and we believe if a technology works, it works, and we stick with it. Junior developers, however, come in with a fresh perspective on things. When I've worked in teams with junior developers, I found that their curiosity brings a fresh perspective to things. So they'll ask questions, they'll engage, and usually it ends up um, having me question my decisions around, for instance, the design or architecture of a system. So I feel like their participation in teams really brings a different perspective to it. When we have a diverse team, we end up moving away from stereotypes and we actually start focusing on facts and on evidence. Because now we can't portray our stereotypes if we're diverse in the, in the group. Secondly, a diverse team breeds a diverse market. Diverse teams see more use cases, they find more flaws, and they, they find diverse solutions. So let's go through some examples where there's been, it could have, where the products could have been improved if there was a diverse team behind it. So I'm gonna play this video. Um, I've switched on off this, oops. Sorry. I don't know why this video is not playing. Okay, I'm just gonna talk through it. So in this example, maybe a lot of you have actually seen this because it trended on Twitter in 2017 and it had a lot of retweets and likes. Um, but in this example, basically a white man puts his hand under the hand sanitizer and the soap comes out. And then a black person puts his hand under the hand sanitizer and there's no soap. Eventually he takes a white tissue paper or towel he puts it on top of his hand and he puts it under the hand sanitizer and suddenly there's soap again. That's not very useful. So the, the thing that surprised me the most about this is how did the company building the hand sanitizer come from a design phase, they put it together, they installed the hand sanitizer, and all during this process it wasn't tested on one black person's hand under the hand sanitizer that completely baffles me. Amazon's same day delivery service was actually um, released a couple of years ago. And they were unavailable in zip codes that were predominantly black neighborhoods at one point. So for example, in New York City, a same day delivery was available throughout Manhattan, Staten Island, and Brooklyn, 
whereas predominantly uh, black areas in Bronx and some majority black neighborhoods in Queens um, were not actually provided with the service. Amazon same day delivery also extended to the outskirts of many suburbs, yet they were not um, created for uh, predominantly black neighborhoods within the city limits. And my favorite is um, Apple. So Apple actually released a health kit in 2014. It boasted its, its ability to record blood pressure, daily steps, calories, respiratory rates, and even blood alcohol levels. But it left out women's menstrual cycles. How can an app that promises to let you see your whole health picture neglect include one of the most important aspects of, health, of women's health? Apple updated it a year later. These updates and bug fixes are all well. However, they should be actually in the forefront and um, in the foremost of our mind. This becomes easier when we have diverse teams. If Apple had had perhaps more women on their team, maybe someone would have gone, oh, but we should include this in our app. We are in an era where AI is becoming really popular, and with AI, we tend to feed it data. And so if we are feeding it biased data, we are actually going to end up building exclusive environments instead of inclusive ones. Hence, is it, it is essential that the teams that are building out our future products actually represent the diverse markets that they're going into. Next, um, diverse teams lead to greater innovation. So a study last year was done by Boston's uh, consulting group, which looked at 1,700 companies across eight countries. And they found that organizations with a higher diverse management actually had 19% higher reven revenues in, uh, because of innovation. So you may feel like working with people um, that think the same way as you do, that um, have the same background as you do, that like the same things as you do, might be easier. But in fact, we end up dodging costly pitfalls of conformity when we have diverse teams. Hence, we discourage innovative thinking. Higher employee engagement is another benefit. When employees in your team feel included, they are more likely to be engaged. Research at Deloitte Australia found that teams that are focused on diversity and inclusion tend to deliver the highest levels of engagement. When employees feel valued, accepted, and empowered, they are also happier and more motivated, and hence they are easier to retain. As a result, companies with greater diversity have a lower turnover rate, hence less recruitment costs. Diversity will also help you to attract better talent. I know when I look for a job and if I see, for instance, an all white male lineup group photo on the website of the company, I am like, maybe that place isn't for me. Or sometimes I think, challenge accepted. <laughs> so businesses that build and promote diversity in the workplace are usually more ethically and socially responsible as well. It means that they actually care about these things, which therefore attract more talent to the companies. They also open new markets, customers, and business partners. In a nutshell, enriching your employee pool with a representative of different genders, races, and nationalities is vital for boosting your company's intellectual potential. Creating a more diverse workplace will help you to keep your team members' biases in check and actually let them question their assumptions. At the same time, we need to make sure that whilst we have diversity in organizations, we also need to cater for inclusion. We need to make sure that everybody feels included. All of this can make your team smarter, they can grow, and it can make your organizations feel more successful. Now, many people may be scared to ask this, but they are thinking, won't diverse individuals actually cause more friction in the team? The answer to this is yes. Hells to the yes, that's going to happen. But that doesn't mean that if something is difficult, it's not important, right? There's a key to balancing diversity and inclusion and cohesion within a team, and it can be found by the study by Muzaffar Sharif in the 1960s. It's called the Robbers Cave Experiment. 
So Muzaffar Sharif had invited 22 boys um, to a camp, and they were pretty much of similar race, religion, and economical backgrounds. In the first phase, he actually separated these groups, the, these boys, these 22 boys, into two separate groups. And he had called them the Rattlers and the Eagles. So as each group formed its own identity, they began to sort of display hostility towards each other, just as when groups are separated, there tends to be this competitiveness. During the second phase, the two groups were then given full-on competitive tasks, and the tension boiled over. They started name-calling each other, they started sabotaging each other's efforts, and they started sort of displaying uh, violent behavior. In the third phase, the researcher actually attempted to reduce the tensions. And so what he did is he asked them to work together uh, with a common goal. And he found that that really changed the entire tenor of the team. So by the end of the camp, he found that the two groups, when working towards a common goal, actually had fallen into a friendly camaraderie. We cannot expect people to understand each other just by throwing diverse people into a room together. It's going to be chaos. We need to actually help them to work towards a common goal, and that's how we have cohesion. So I've spoken a lot about common goals, so let's get into more depth about that. I believe that working towards a common goal actually causes um, teams to be more effective. My favorite analogy of a team um, was said by Elon Musk, and he, he said that we can think of people in any teams as, in any given team as vectors. And a vector has both direction and magnitude. When people all work in precisely the same direction, then we, their magnitudes are added, towards each other, added to each other. However, when there is a degree of deviation, that magnitude and impact is subtracted, and hence we do not have the maximum amount of productivity that we can achieve. So let's illustrate that with a few more examples. So the first example is um, going, it's going to take into account just four hypothetical team members. And the first scenario is the null vector. So in this case, the sum of the vectors, are, let's say you have a team, a team of four people. There are two people pulling in one direction and two people pulling in the other direction. Um, in this case, the sum of the four vectors is actually called the null vector. A null vector has zero magnitude and has no direction. So in our example, the company would actually be making zero progress. It's important to note that even though these four people may be the most amazing and talented people within the company, in fact, if they are pulling in opposite directions and there's no magnitude or no direction, then they are actually perfectly misaligned and hence perfectly zero progress. Scenario two is suboptimal. So, in a more likely scenario, you're actually going to find majority of the team working in the correct direction, and there's probably that one person that's pulling in the opposite direction. That's what you call a suboptimal um, alignment of the team. And the last scenario is the aligned vectors, and this is what Elon Musk strives for. Whether or not it's possible, it's something that we should still strive towards. So this is when you have all your vectors aligned and everybody is moving in the correct direction. That's how you have maximum impact and how you have maximum progress. So you add up all the vectors and the magnitude and the impact is at its highest. Nothing has been wasted, there's no inefficiency, and there's no one pulling in the wrong direction. This is not, this is, in, in the real world, this is probably not 100% possible. But again, we should be striving towards this. So here are the vectors that need to be aligned. So firstly, aligning individual teams with organizations, and then aligning organizations to actual customer needs. In order to align vectors, wait, oops, I mean people, we need to firstly <laughs> set clear goals. So we need to be um, we need to be able to communicate to people what their goals are. It's kind of like running a marathon, right? If we don't know what the actual um, direction is, or we don't know the course of it, or we don't know where the finish line is, then some may go in the wrong direction and may not actually end up at the finish line. 
Some may not even know they're running a marathon at all. So I think it's really important to be able to clearly outline your goals. The second point is that we, we need to give transparency into companies. So at the company that I work for, um, we basically have transparency into financial information, investments, and into sales. I'm not saying that we need to go into that level of detail. But if goals are set for each quarter at a high level, and then with, within each sprint, we're actually working towards their goals, we end up being more focused. And finally, goals mean absolutely nothing if they are not communicated to everybody. And I mean everybody within the company. I know at some of the companies that we had, we literally had goals in the bathroom stools whilst you're sitting on the toilet, you're able to see the company's goals. <laughs> That's a bit next level, but. <laughs> Um, this brings me on to the next point of an effective team. Everyone knows that communication is key, but not everyone gives it its due diligence. So I like to think of a team as the engine of a car. Even if each of the parts of the engine are well oiled and cared for, without the other engine components, you may not even be able to start that car. And sorry, I also like this, um, the saying by George Barnard Shaw, and it really resonates with me, because it is true, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Um, so each member in the team will be working on the individual projects or features of a system, and which when combined together will basically create your completed picture. By implementing an ongoing communication strategy, the project will come together seamlessly. So at a minimum, usually, the team members would include maybe some sort of back-end developer, front-end developer, designer, product manager, and even possibly the client. And each of the duties of each of those members can be pretty separate. However, in order to build a seamless system, communication between those different entities have to happen. When I talk about communication, I'm not saying that we need to get up from our chairs, walk over to a person, tap them on the back, make them take off their headphones, and then talk to you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that employ the correct communication based on what your requirements are. Make sure that your communication is effective and that you're able to maybe even reference that communication afterwards. Quantity in communication is just like clothing. It's overrated, but it's the quality which translates to the effectiveness of the communication. So effective communication means that you actually including all the relevant parties. Don't get the entire company in on a meeting when you actually need to talk to a few people. It means relaying uh, information on the correct time, so things like goals and delays, expectations, relay them beforehand. It's listening to others with an open mind and respect for one another. It's giving constructive feedback in a mindful manner. And finally, it is about using the correct uh, channels based on natures of conversations. Who in the crowd here today uses Slack for their communications? as pretty much almost everyone. So Slack is great when it's used with the correct etiquette. It's also a useful leveling, leveling ground for introverts and extroverts, making it easier to feel heard without getting out of your comfort zone. That can be a good and a bad thing. But decisions can be made quicker whilst keeping everybody in the loop and on the same page. This is provided that you keep your, you keep your conversation scoped to channels there should be channels for different things that allow you to actually have those conversations so that things don't get lost in the shuffle of one big channel. Um, also, let's not go channel crazy and like pull millions of channels. Um, the second point is don't act on your brain farts. Every time you think of something, don't just type it into someone's Slack channel. That's not cool. Um, and finally, don't send instant messages expecting someone to instantly reply, unless it's an emergency. Um, a, study, a study that was done actually said that it takes, when someone is disrupted from the task at hand, it takes 23 minutes and 15 seconds, which is an awfully specific number, but that's what the study said, um, to get back to the task. 
So I don't know how many of you experienced this. I'm pretty sure almost everybody. But someone DMs you on Slack, and they go, hello. And then they wait for you to respond. And then you go, hello, back. And then they'll, they, they, they don't actually tell you what they need from you immediately. Um, and then finally, when you're getting into what they require, they then you just see like Chinese typing for like 10 minutes into this channel. And like it's, it's literally impossible to focus on anything else at that time. Um, so also, I know that email is a thing of the past. And I personally don't use a lot of email. But sometimes email is the right tool to use when you want to get across um, something in a more structured and coherent way. Or perhaps even a document is a better way to do this. It will also give the receiver an opportunity to actually ponder over your thoughts and then provide insight and thoughtful feedback on that. Um, finally, keep in mind that as your team grows and you add diversity into your team, whether it be race, religion, gender, etc., it also means that you will need to change the nature of your communication to adapt to the different cultures within your team. There are different ways to communicate with different people. Each culture has their own way of communicating. And you want to be communicated with in the manner that you feel best and you feel is most respectful. The fourth point is psychological safety. So that's that, that big discussion that I have up there. But to me, psychological safety is just about creating environments where employees feel accepted and they feel respected. There are ways to identify psychological safety. And some of the things that developers feel OK about is being able to make mistakes and not being punished for it, but rather leaving it, learning from it as a team. They are able to voice their opinions without the fear of uh, being judged, irrespective of the seniority across the table. Um, there's many developers that walk into a room and you feel like you can't ask a question because everyone's going to think you're just stupid. Um, that's not a nice team to be a part of where you have that fear. There's also mutual respect for each other. And finally, being listened to. If you remember from earlier, when Google did their massive study, Project Aristotle, um, one, of the main, um, one of the main learnings from uh, the team effectiveness was actually psychological safety. So let's actually dive into that Google study a little bit further. And um, the, the head of the industry at Google took to implementing psychological safety at Google. And he came up with the following um, steps on how to implement it. So his name was Paul Sintagata. Again, hope I'm not butchering his surname. Um, so I'm going to summarize it for you. So the first thing is approach conflict as a collaborator, not as an adversary. Because when you have that perception of winning and losing, it never creates a, a productive environment. Then secondly, speak human to human. Every human has this innate need to be respected, to be valued, um, to be spoken to in a way that makes them feel important. Um, if we do this, we tend to have more positive um, communication with the next person. Anticipate reactions and plan counter moves. This sounds very strategic, but in actual fact, when you're talking to your audience, start thinking about what kind of questions they'll, they'll ask you. What kind of questions do you need to answer? So specifically, when he delivers talks or feedback to people, he asks himself, what are my main points? What are three ways that my listeners are likely to respond? And how will I respond to each of these scenarios? Fine, and then replace blame with curiosity. So if team members sense that you're trying to blame them for something, they immediately become defensiveness, uh, defensive. I'm sure all of you have seen this. Um, the alternate to blame is actually rather be curious. Ask them questions about what they're explaining to you. Um, so some of the things that he suggests is actually state the behavior or outcome as an uh, as an observation and use factual and neutral language. So for example, you could say, in the past two months, Katie, we've seen a drop in your performance. Um, and your progress seems to be a little bit slow. Engage them in, ex oops, sorry, ex engage them in exploration. 
For example, ask them, um, so I imagine there are multiple, multiple factors to this. How can we support you in order to be able to do this? And then ask for feedback on delivery. So when you deliver something, it's important to get feedback so that you don't make the same mistakes the next time. And finally, it's important to measure psychological safety. It, ask your team how safe do they feel or gather this feedback anonymously from them. So psychological safety was my last point, and I'd like to say that I think it's one of the most one of the more important points because when you feel safe in a team, you end up being more productive within that team. So on that note, let's recap what we've done so far. So the first thing we said that makes a team effective and productive is to be able to create diverse and inclusive teams um, so that we can build innovative solutions. The second one is working towards a common goal and we make sure that we're making progress and impact. The third one is communicating effectively using the necessary tools. So don't do brain farts in DMs, please. Um, and building products that are well oiled together instead of mosaics fitted together. And finally, the most important one is to make each other feel safe. Um, by, seeking, by seeking and blundering, we tend to learn. I believe that if we go into the workforce using these specific lessons, we'll actually build amazing things together. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Um, you can chat to me afterwards if you want to talk about anything, and you'll find I'm a very annoying Twitter user. You can follow me. Um, yeah, any questions? Thank <laughs> you.